Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001 when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research on different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy, and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal India Quarterly is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. A very good afternoon everyone. I am Pragya Pandey, research fellow at the ICWA. On behalf of the ICWA, it is my pleasure to welcome you all for this webinar on India and the 1982 UNCLOS. Allow me to brief you about the program and introduce our panelists for today. 
The webinar will be chaired by Professor Bimal and Patel. Professor Patel is the Director General and Professor of International Law at the Raksha Shakti University, Gujarat. I'm delighted to welcome our eminent panelist for the webinar, Dr. Anirudh Rajput. He is the member of United Nations International Law Commission 2017 to 21, and he is also a member of ICWA Governing Council. Our next panelist is Dr. Captain Sarabjit Singh Parmar. He is the Executive Director of National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi. I will also be joining as one of the speaker uh, in the panel. We are very pleased to have with us Dr. Vijay Sakhuja as, as the discussant for the day. Dr. Sakhuja is the direct, former Director General, National Maritime Foundation, uh, New Delhi, and currently he's associated with ICWA. Before I hand over the uh, floor to the chair, uh, some customary house rules to be announced. All the speakers and panelists are requested to mute themselves when they are not speaking. Questions will be taken during the Q&A session. Questions can be asked by registered attendees live by typing through chat box, and these questions will be visible to the chair as well as to the panelists. Questions should be kept brief and to the point. In case any of the speakers are facing connectivity issue, they may switch off the camera and continue on the audio mode. With this, uh, I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Bimal Patel uh, to conduct the proceedings for the day. So. Sir, you are muted. So please unmute yourself. Yes, sure. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Pragya, and um, all my eminent panelists on the board, Anirudh, Vijay, Tarabjit. So, um, of course, uh, once once we'll have your uh, presentation, I will introduce or Pragya will introduce with your um, background. Uh, so I would, uh, without taking time, would take to go to my uh, remarks as a chair. Uh, we are indeed grateful to the ICWA for infusing a huge booster, if I say, of intellectual discourses on all aspects of foreign policy, multilateralism, placing before the world policymakers and intellectuals alike, positions and perspectives of India in subtle and at times in straightforward manner. And it is up to the recipients and addresses to grasp back accordingly. So today's seminar is one of those building blocks in this larger vision of India and for India in the field of law of the sea and maritime law. UNCLOS 1982 is one of the earliest international instruments which can be seen as reflecting the aspirations of developing nations. The 1958 and 1960 conferences and conventions were far from reflecting the aspirations. No surprise, India's refusal to sign those instruments. If those instruments failed to take stock of realities of the newly independent countries, then the same can be said today, namely, when these states are independent and require that unclaws cater to their needs, concerns and interests, the interpretation and implementation of the norms have to be seen in these changed realities. While the intentions of the founding fathers are all but welcome, aspirations of future generations are especially important if the unclaws has to remain relevant. UNCLOS is indeed a constitution of the ocean, and that is how everyone perceives. But let's be very, very clear. Let's not become legal monks. Let us not allow our legal tax to acquire sanctity and go the way of all sacred writings. This applies aptly when we take upon today's discourse on India and UNCLOS. Friends, besides several pending issues, that were deliberately kept unattended and left to the implementation of the convention as per the evolving norms and the state practice. There are a number of most critical issues which we face today whose answers are partly available in UNCLOS and partly attempted by state practice, with all consequences for lawyers to argue and judges to interpret. So let me attempt two most important and critical ones as I see. Uh, first of all, the interpretation of UNCLOS by international courts and tribunals. We all know there is a rich jurisprudence emerging from ICJ, ICLOS, European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, as well as international tribunal, arbitral tribunals and the WTO dispute settlement body. 
these institutions have in their own the interaction between the sources of international law of the sea to various substantial procedural and institutional aspects of the regulatory framework which inclos has actually envisaged to establish secondly the maritime delimitation <coughs> of course this issue will uh, be discussed in depth by uh, dr rajput uh, this is one of the most crucial issues how this process actually can be analyzed through interaction between international tribunals and states in the development of the delimitation process and how one can explain rationally how a judiciary created approach to delimit maritime boundary has been accepted by states and as maritime claims emerge in various parts of the globe and can happen in this part of the world too it is essential that we understand the underlying theories of maritime delimitation including the relationship between delimitation and delineation the effect of third stage rights on delimitation and the manner in which each of the stage of the process influences the other stages maritime delimitation remains a very frequent subject of adjudication in cases brought before the icj tribunals and of course during the last few years before the clos this brings me close to the third issue that is the legal order in the world's oceans and the unclos how implementation of the unclos has contributed to the legal order in the world ocean which ocean affairs or law of the sea of the united nations the area and the international seabed authority the iclos the dispute settlement the commission on the limits of the continent itself sustainable fisheries including the un fish stocks agreement and of course operative operational implementation icis and seabed have found and will find particular attention from all the relevant stakeholders how the unclos has to be seen as far as the application of the high seas regime in the eez is concerned as the world community grows more concerned about these two areas that is eez particularly if you look at the australian i would say the law of 2015 it is essential for us to understand the complex relationship that exists between the high seas and the eez and the three cardinal freedoms of the sea there is the freedom of navigation freedom of over flight and freedom to lay the main cables and pipelines the law of the sea bed the access use and protection of the resources as india and for that region number of seabed mining countries prepare for the exploration exploitation we need to be aware of the most pressing legal questions raised by the use and protection of natural resources on and underneath the world's seabeds the seabed plays a major role in the earth's ecological balance it is both a medium and a resource and is central to the blue economy the new usage and the new knowledge about seabed ecosystems and the risk of disputes due to competing interests or reflection on which regulatory approaches to pursue as india starts rolling out the sagar mala vision because the regulation of ocean activities essentially sector based as we all know and we need to be aware of the parallel international and national regimes for seabed mining the oil and the gas the energy generation the bottom fisheries marine genetic resources the carbon sequestration and of course most importantly maritime security oper operations both within and beyond the national jurisdiction the future of ocean governance and capacity development is another major issue which the unclos has laid down in so many provisions the future of ocean governance includes the challenges of law of the sea in general but also the challenges of the ocean science integrated coastal and ocean management which is partly national domain the fisheries and aquaculture the communication negotiations maritime safety security and maritime transportation so therefore it is very important for us to understand the future of ocean governance and also the capacity development the maritime law the maritime law remains in motion and there is often interchange of vocabulary 
on my time law and law of the sea as unclaws is we can say custodian of both subsets is essential that we gain insights into various contemporary issues in public and private maritime law including the interdisciplinary aspects as much as the knowledge of public international law and law of the sea is required forum like this can hardly afford to have no discourses perhaps in future on commercial maritime law conflict of laws and new developments in the application of advanced technologies to maritime law issues the icwa the national maritime foundation the rashtriya rakshya university and other institutions can indeed provide platform for discussion on the role of imo on regulatory and private law matters within the domain of marine environmental law the law respecting seafarers affairs and maritime pedagogics maritime security competitive law in the maritime field the trade law even the taxation law in the maritime context the maritime arbitration the carriage of passengers port law and limitation of liability besides this globalistic perspective let me highlight few important regional and bilateral perspective first as people start talking about indo pacific or asia pacific region in the context of my earlier remark on seabed mining i would underline that as far as this part of the world is concerned there is a need for strong cooperation and engagement especially in this part of the world there is a lack of specific regulations defining the terms and conditions for exploitation which will remain a significant barrier to deep seabed mining secondly the development of regulations by the international seabed authority and thirdly how the near universal acceptance of the unclos has increased the confidence of the isha the successful trial mining the increased demand for strategic metals and tightening of supplies and this suggests that seabed mining on a commercial scale will soon occur and therefore is very important india as a pioneering seabed industry country plays an important role as isa continues to develop regulations in this area the south china sea is well discussed at all levels with all permutations and combinations so i will avoid any remark on that however few important disputes deserve some remarks first the timor list and australian conciliation which is not very much reported is heralded actually as a victory for unclosed and peaceful settlement of disputes this dispute indeed allows us to understand the procedural aspects as well as a step by step account of the conciliation process as well as its wider implications for dispute settlement under unclos and or even beyond how conciliation is emerging and can indeed emerge as a means of dispute settlement and the conciliation procedure is in unclos is very very useful particularly these disputes contains insights into the comprehensive examination of each step of the conciliation proceedings the role of conciliation commission the conciliation commission's decision on competence the issues of joint development the maritime boundary treaty which timor list and australia concluded as the legal outcome of the conciliation proceedings why i am saying this because when the close rendered its award visavi india and bangladesh and myanmar and bangladesh and there is definitely what we call the gray zone so in the future we might very well be thinking about the role of conciliation instead of referring the matter straight to any adjudicating authority like icj or itlos i am yet to read thoroughly and i would say more academic literature literature is yet to be out on this particular dispute but what i can see is that the dispute has definitely raised awareness and has brought more familiarity with conciliation as a viable and effective dispute settlement process and thereby it would encourage in my view states to consider conciliation as a very good thing to settle their disputes second important is the europe 
how the Europe is grappling with the Baltic Sea governance and there exist several regulatory gaps. I'm mentioning this particularly because similar experience can happen in this part of the world too. In case of Baltic Sea, and I'm, I'm pretty sure my colleagues will agree with me that we believe that in this part of the world, there are a lot of gaps. In Baltic Sea as well, there have been number of regulatory gaps and these regulatory gaps emerged from the multiple layers of up to six, six layers of regulation, general international law, regional conventions, EU law, national law, local and municipal law rules, plus a whole range of non-binding norms and other soft law arrangements. And they all act in parallel. So, however, a large number of rules or regulatory layer does not in itself ensure effectiveness or consistency vis-a-vis -vis in clause. This is very fascinating area of research as well as understanding. And when the regulatory landscape is approached from the point of view of individual substantive topics, it is apparent that the norms of different regulatory layers entail both overlaps, gaps and uncertainties differently for each topic. In other words, it is the Baltic Sea gaps clearly tell us that this situation will also exist and the way the European countries have tried to settle their differences and I would not say disputes but differences in that particular area is something very important for us particularly in the in the ocean to learn from and through this particularly Baltic Sea experience we can actually learn the regulatory anatomy of various issues which we are playing out in the Baltic context such as how the regulatory gaps are formed because it will also those gaps will also be formed here as as more and more uh, our awareness about oceans importance goes on how these gaps are filled how the rules of the different layers work together and how they're interacting with each other in in the areas it could be fisheries it could be narcotics it could be human smuggling so and so forth so this is very fascinating areas of studies which again uh, institutions which, which I mentioned earlier can definitely take up on. Finally, some parallel problems. How the disputed water and seabed resource in Asia and Europe will test the utility of the UNCLOS. The settlement of the maritime boundary dispute between China and Japan in the East China Sea and between Greece and Turkey in the Aegean Sea, which we discussed a couple of weeks back, we all know is politically deadlocked. While diplomatic settlement and efforts have been ongoing for the past several decades, neither side in each case is appearing prepared to back down from their respective maritime and territorial claims. Incidents are occurring. They are prompting diplomatic protests, military standoffs, even exchange of fire. This existing status quo is inherently unstable and does not favor either side to the extent that it holds hostage the multiple benefits that could otherwise be generated from the exploitation of seabed energy and mineral resources in these disputed waters. And this creates an urgent need for a meaningful discussion on finding a practical way forward when such disputes can arise in our parts of the world. And this also reminds that these two disputes provide important reminders how UNCLOS is unable to resolve some of the historical disputes and see whether we can have some possible institutional designs of interstate cooperation over deeped activities in disputed maritime areas and can we make recommendations for the prospect of realizing joint development regimes, learning a little bit from the East China or, or Asian, but I would say well in advance. So these are some of the issues which, which I think uh, forms like this must be discussing partly looking at the past, realizing the inherent limitations of the UNCLOS and fully anticipating that the gaps will exist. The gaps have to be filled by the state practice, by the intellectual discourses like this one. And at the end of the day, such discourses can only contribute to what I would consider the legal order of the oceans. So with these remarks, um, I would hand it back to you, 
my colleague Pragya for the further proceedings. Thank you. Uh, may I now invite our first panelist uh, for the day, Dr. Anirudh Rajput, who is the member of United Nations International Law Commission, and he's also a member of Governing Council of ICWA to kindly uh, make his presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pragya. Also, thank you to the chairperson, Professor Patel, who just gave his opening remarks. Thanks to ICWA. It's a pleasure to be here again and a pleasure to be a part of this distinguished panel. I've been requested to focus upon certain aspects of maritime delimitation which arise in the context of UNCLOS. But before I do that, I wish to make two preliminary points. The first preliminary point is that five years back, nobody heard or even knew of UNCLOS. And I include even lawyers, not just other people. We owe a great debt to the Annex 7 Tribunal constituted under UNCLOS, administered by the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which delivered the South China Sea Award in 2016, and suddenly UNCLOS maritime delimitation became the talk of the town, which is a positive development because it tries to bring the perceptively complex area of maritime delimitation and the so-called more agonizing and at times mysterious acronym of UNCLOS into what we call, can call the common lingo, that is the linguistic used by common man. So that is the first positive development, which brings to, to one's notice the importance of any treaty or any rule of international law. Any rule or any principle of international law could not be simply forgotten and be said to be uh, suffering from the fate of time because you never know when it will come to prominence and how much prominence it will gain. Unclause is one of those areas which has gained prominence and it will continue to gain prominence in times to come. Professor Patel has already briefly touched upon the contribution of the third world in fact, the contribution of third world to the preparation of UNCLOS is a big topic in itself and deserves a full-fledged consideration. And including concepts such as archipelago of states, maritime delimitation, territorial sea, but I think that should be left for another day since that would be digressing from my topic. The second preliminary point I wish to make is it is often a tendency, and I have often noticed, it's very easy or rather tempting to criticize a document and then say, we need to change it. We need to amend it. It is not helpful. There are too many gaps. I must confess, I myself being a lawyer, I make a little out of fine gap. At times, it is important to recognize what has been achieved, then try to reflect, if at all, what are those gaps and how those gaps need to be filled in. So any discussion on amending on clause would be almost like a fairy tale because those who wish it to be amended should see what is happening in the negotiations of the marine and bi uh, biological resources beyond national jurisdiction, BBNJ negotiations. The negotiations are indeed difficult. So what we need to realize is what we have in front of us and how we can address and try to deal with what we have rather than aspiring for what we would like to have. Of course, that should not stop us from aspiring, but we need to be realistic at certain stages as well. And with that sense of realism, I want to make some reflections, present some reflections on principles of maritime delimitation as encapsulated or as enunciated under UNCLOS. There are three major contributions of UNCLOS that one needs to keep in mind. In fact, these four new innovations have led to a lot of development in the field of maritime delimitation. The first is specifying the limits of the territorial sea. It is not just specifying the limits of the territorial sea, it is also for certain states and in particular European states, expanding 
the, the, the extent of the territorial sea. UNCLOS for the first time sets out that all territorial states are entitled to claim a territorial sea up to 12 nautical miles. The extent of territorial sea was one of the most controversial areas. The matter was first discussed in the International Law Commission, which came out with the Law of the Sea 1956 draft articles, which eventually became the basis of the four conventions, the four Geneva Conventions one of which is a convention on the territorial sea, 1958. Even there, what came out as the states were unwilling to decide as to what is the extent of territorial sea they wish to claim. Is it three nautical miles? Is it five nautical miles? And this debate was one of the crucial reasons why the second law of the sea convention negotiations failed because states were unwilling to agree how much should be the territorial sea. This mix became further complicated when states came to negotiate. When states came to negotiate UNCLOS, and that is one of the most important contributions of the third world. The European states were insisting that the territorial sea should be minimal, not more than three nautical miles or five nautical miles. The reason being it gave them an opportunity to have their spying vessels easily traversing through the territorial sea without being objected to. The developing countries being fully conscious and aware of this said, no, we need a territorial sea and we need a 12 nautical mile territorial sea. We'll allow you access to that, but that would be only a freedom of transit. You can simply pass through it, but you cannot stop or do other activities which you would be allowed to do otherwise on the high seas. So, for the first time, we do see that a distance of territorial sea accepted in the form of UNCLOS, that is 12 nautical miles. Also for the European states who are looking forward towards conservative territorial sea were forced to, to give away or accept or even claim for themselves a longer territorial sea. The moment the territorial sea expanded, those states whose coasts, coasts were close to each other, either adjacent that is next to each other or opposite to each other, but were of a dist where the distance between those two coasts was 24 nautical miles or lesser than that, automatically resulted into disputes of territorial sea. So to that extent, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea in a way created space for new disputes between states because they could make a territorial sea claim up to 12 nautical miles and then decided how that is to be delimited. Now, the procedure for delimitation is itself slightly complex, but I'll come to that when I discuss about the fourth part, because that's where these whole procedures are really connected. And that ties back to the point Professor Patel raised about, if one might say, the appropriateness of interpretation of these principles by international courts and tribunals while deciding maritime delimitation. So the first point is we have a recognized and identified distance of 12 nautical miles. Often people say international law is indeterminate. This is one of the clear answers to them. In international law, territorial sea is only 12 nautical miles. There might be disputes about where to have a baseline from. And again, baseline is another topic to discuss for one full day, so I won't venture into it but simply say that all depends on where states put their base points, how they decide to connect their base points. And one of the raging controversies at the moment in relation to several national laws is drawing of straight baselines because straight baselines cannot always be drawn. You have to have a line which is the low water mark. Apologies for using these technical terms, but in the interest of time, I should better not get too much into that and move on to the next point. Now, territorial sea, the distance of territorial sea and delimitation of territorial sea is the first important contribution of UNCLOS, or rather a new creation of UNCLOS which resulted into disputes. The second creation is specifying the distance for the continental shelf. Now, prior to UNCLOS, the idea was continental shelf is a natural prolongation of the land territory. Now, this concept was basically discussed in the Commission and the Commission was, there was, of course, discussion about having two not 200 nautical miles, but
But the feeling was it is better to leave it for a scientific assessment and to decide whether to uh, whether the the seabed subsoil or the area under the water is something which is similar to the landmass and therefore belongs to that state. In other words, the character of the area underneath the sea adjoining the landmass has to be of the same character of the coast. This would bring in geology, geomorphology and geologists to come and tell and decide whether it's a continental shelf. So it became a scientific exercise rather than a pure legal exercise. What UNCLOS did was UNCLOS said hereafter it will be 200 nautical miles. Now by specifying 200 nautical miles what it did was it provided a distance criteria and then associated to that it did, did not de-recognize the geographical criteria. It said the geographical criteria continues but that would be something that would be an extended continental shelf. That is a continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles, which you can claim. But in order to claim, you have to produce scientific material which satisfies those requirements. And who would decide whether you have satisfied those requirements was the Committee on the Extended Continental Shelf, the CLCS. Now, the interesting part about the CLCS, it does not comprise of any lawyers. It does not give any decisions as such, but it makes recommendations. And that's again a big explosive topic. And uh, I see that IC, ICW has already had some of the members from CLCS come here and speak in the past. And I think that's another topic on which CLCS should, uh, uh, ICW should consider working on. The organizers might say I'm giving less of a presentation and more of a suggestion on the topics to do in the future. But that's the nature of UNCLOS because it is that wide. Now, this is the second thing. It provided that 200 nautical miles. Therefore, even those states who did not have a natural prolongation of the land territory and would not otherwise have been able to claim continental shelf became entitled to claim the continental shelf up to 200 nautical miles, thereby creating a set of disputes because states could now go up to 200 nautical miles. The third important contribution to creation of disputes and in a sense also regulation is the concept of the exclusive economic zone. The concept of exclusive economic zone is an exclusive creation of negotiations at UNCLOS. And it was at the insistence of certain Latin American states who did not have continental shelf. They said because we don't have continental shelf, we need something up to 200 nautical miles where we can have exclusive rights. And when they started claiming it, everybody else also claimed. But the difference between continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone now is that the continental shelf rights are the rights which are associated with the seabed, resources which are under the water. Whereas exclusive economic zone rights are rights in relation to super adjacent water, that is using the water for several purposes. It might be fishing, using it for windmills, if, for example, if you place an oil rig, although the oil rig is using the continental shelf, but it is off, of course, certainly in the sea as well in the waters. But of course, if there's no continental shelf, there can't be an oil rig because you need a continental shelf. The oil would be found underneath. Simply can't put it uh, uh, on, on the sand because you most probably would not find. Of course, I stand corrected by, by experts of, of, of petroleum sciences, but my impression is that's the situation. So states who could not have continental shelf got exclusive economic zone, which again became 200 nautical miles. Now for those states who already had continental shelf, for them, yes, it was an add on of getting rights on the super adjacent water. But that also added to more disputes and who gets the share and how to get it. Now, these three developments were coupled with the fourth most important development, which one could call the game changer in the whole business. Why I call it a game changer? Because prior to that, if you look at articles, uh, the, 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 the Geneva Conventions and the Territorial Sea on the continental shelf, all these conventions provided for states to primarily negotiate. And if they failed to negotiate, then they provided that states could have an equidistance line or they could have an equitable solution. But the emphasis was on, on equidistance line and if there were special circumstances, historical reasons, you could depart. But the emphasis was an agreement 
And there was no other option from agreement because there was a protocol for dispute resolution, which nobody signed up to. So there was no dispute resolution for maritime delimitation in the, in the Do, prior. Dr. Uh, yes. you, have, you have two, two, two minutes. Yes, because then of course. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Now I'm coming to the fourth point, which should, which should help me to finish in the next two minutes. Uh, the fourth point, that is what I was telling about is compulsory dispute resolution. What UNCLOS provides is you have to get all your disputes resolved peacefully. And there is a big potential there because it's not just maritime delimitation. There are several other pillars. There are several other subject matters, for example, marine environment uh, or uh, or freedom of, of navigation, uh, prompt arrest release, several aspects which get now resolved to a compulsory dispute resolution procedure. I don't have a time to elaborate on that. But on maritime delimitation, UNCLOS provides, if you haven't made an exception to maritime delimitation dispute, that is articles 15 for the territorial sea, 74 for the exclusive economic zone, and 83 for the, for the continental shelf. If you haven't have made these exceptions, then all disputes have to go for compulsory adjudication, which means all disputes have now to be resolved. But if you want to exclude these disputes from compulsory dispute resolution, then it doesn't mean that you can exclude it forever. If you want to exclude them, then you have to go for compulsory conciliation. Conciliation is fundamentally a consensual method of dispute resolution. But UNCLOS has two types of conciliation. One is uh, through agreement and second is compulsory. So when states have maritime delimitation disputes and they have made a reservation under Article 298, sub Article 1, Paragraph A, saying that they want to exclude this dispute from maritime delimitation, then they have to go for compulsory uh, conciliation. And Timor Leste versus Australia is a very interesting award. Although the, uh, the, the Conciliation Commission conducted the proceedings almost like a dispute resolution, but it was not a dispute resolution procedure. Australia raised a jurisdictional uh, objection on which the Conciliation Commission did give a ruling, but it can't be strictly called a ruling. It simply upheld its jurisdiction. And thereafter, what he did, that the Conciliation Commission came up with a set of proposals and never met the parties together. It spoke with the parties individually and gave their suggestions individually to the parties and trying to persuade them to arrive at a setting. And this is an important aspect to explore in the future. If a state that has made an exception to the compulsory dispute resolution procedure, when forced to go for conciliation, can such a state not participate in the proceedings, even if conciliation by itself is a voluntary consent? It might have to participate, the Conciliation Commission would come up with its own observations and conclusions. Now to sum up, I haven't gotten into the rules of maritime delimitation because they would need a lot of time to elaborate. But one thing is clear from the way Articles 15, 74 and 83 were structured. If you look at the negotiating history, there was something called Group 7, which negotiated mostly in Geneva because they wanted to stay away from the politics of New York. After a lot of discussion, they simply came up with a hushed up solution. And the hushed up solution was for Article 15, territorial sea, go equidistance unless there are exceptions, historical reasons or special circumstances, which basically copied the prior uh, conventions. And the second solution was for 74 and 73 exclusive economic zone and continental shelf, which was equitable outcome. Now, what is equitable outcome was left to court. In fact, it was deliberately left to court. The authority of interpreting those provisions comes to court from the convention. But the problem is how far have courts gone? The courts have not just used that interpretation to resolve continental shelf and territorial sea. They have used those principles and applied them in the territorial sea as well. And in a sense, inundated and removed the treaty provisions of Article 15 and superimposed them with their own judicial decision. Now, they have done that till now. Not many states have noticed it. Not many states have had problems. Some of them had. I understand that Colombia was very unhappy with the International Court of Justice decision in maritime delimitation between Nicaragua, Colombia, and thereafter withdrew its compulsory jurisdiction clause. I, I could be correct, but that's my understanding. If international courts and tribunals 
reasonably exercise the discretion, their credibility will enhance. But if they use it as a free leeway to decide that they want, they're going to create crisis for themselves. The WTO is in crisis. Investment treaty arbitration is in crisis. Of course, they are the adjudicators. But what they don't, can't forget is they have to function in a certain framework and understand the spirit of the treaties. I might have sounded like like a legal monk, as Professor Patel has said, but probably since that that's how I am, I think I've also presented some skeptical views, and it's certainly a topic which needs further reflection, for which I truly congratulate ICWA and stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. <clears throat> thank you, Doctor Rajput. Uh, of course, the question and answers will be entertained towards the end of the webinar. So it is my pleasure to invite uh, my friend, Captain Sarji Singh Parmar, uh, to preside over others to, to, to pre uh, present his views uh, in this webinar. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Patel. And uh, I must thank uh, ICW again for this opportunity. We last met on, in August. So this is like a series of webinars we're doing on UNCLOS. And I think it is needed, as especially what Dr. Rajput brought out, we need to keep constantly debating and asking ourselves that are we going in the right direction. And so with your permission, I will just share my presentation and uh, you can kindly keep me on tag with on uh, online, Dr. Patel, with time. I understand I have 15 minutes. So uh, can you see the uh, presentation? Yes, we can see that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I thought was I said uh, last uh, or oh, or two months back in August, 6th August, when we met up again, ICW conducted a wonderful webinar on UNCLOS. It's broad based. This time I thought, let me look at a certain uh, divergences and convergences with respect to navigation and ocean governance. Since we have uh, sort of opened the door, we need to look at certain specifics. And I thought I'd do just that. And just a flashback of to uh, UNCLOS 3. So it's a sort of a reminder that it was convened as per a UNG resolution of 1970, four main factors, prevention, land grab at sea by developed nations, overfishing, pollution and govern access to offshore non-living resources. A lot of the uh, base issues and the pertinent issues have been covered by Dr. Uh, Rajput and Anirudh. Thank you so much for that because it uh, gives a base for my talk out here. There we have, percent UNCLOS has got three parts if you look at. One is the main UNCLOS of, I will keep referring to UNCLOS 3 as of now. We also have part 11 and we also have uh, the fish stocks agreement. So these three in all actually are sub parts of UNCLOS and we have 168 nations parties who have ratified the main document. 150 have ratified part 11, 84 have ratified the fish stocks agreement and 14 nations have signed but not ratified and 15 nations have neither signed nor acceded to it. This list I had indicated in my last presentation. I don't have intentions of repeating all that again. So I just get down to specificities. But the main issue is this, uh, see the fall in number of nations, 168 to 150 to 84. Now this 84 for ratifying the fish talks agreement is again going to be an interlock, which I will cover is on the issue of marine resources. So we generally look at UNCLOS or so far I've been seeing it in a certain uh, Method. So I thought let's let me take a step back and relook at it from a national point of view, or from a nation's point of view, not from an international constitution of oceans or an international agreement of sorts. So I looked at three main aspects, which when I did a lot of reading, uh, a lot of uh, analysts have looked at from the point of geopolitics or national interests and jurisdictional issues, and of course protection and conservation of marine environment. Now, when you put all these three together and flesh them out. You come out with certain traditional security issues and some non-traditional security issues that are looked at by nations and of course are a part of the debate today when we look at how the world environment is changing. When you put these three together, fresh them out, you can break down the differences, convergence issues under the traditional security and non-security traditional issues out here. But what are the interlocks? Maritime zones has been covered by Anirudh, so I don't intend to go down that path, but this is a major issue. And the major issue here is connected to the sovereignty issue. And uh, South China Sea is a perfect example. I've said it a number of times. Many analysts also refer to it in the same fashion that maritime zones of a nation stem from sovereignty. If a piece of land or a nation is recognized in the maritime zone, sort of flows automatically depending upon if it 
fits the bill as per the UNCLOS. So how UNCLOS has said that maritime zones are to be decided, the distance and the methodology. And also, but if more importantly, there is an issue of sovereignty over an island or islands as in the South China Sea, then of course, your issue of maritime zones becomes more complex because to which nation do they belong and therefore you have this tussle. Now the arbitration uh, by the clause, by the uh, arbitration uh, court between Philippines and the China issue clearly stated uh, about rocks and uh, rocks regimes and islands, but whether it is going to be accepted, China still not uh, accepted the judgment. It is still interpreting uh, unclosed the way it wants to do. And it very clearly also brought out that this is an issue of sovereignty, therefore UNCLOS does not apply. International maritime law also stems from the issue of recognition of sovereignty. We have enough cases in the International Court of Justice and they are spread all over the world. And that also recognizes that maritime zones will come only are recognized if uh, the sovereignty of the nation is recognized. And then UNCLOS was of course established with due regard for the sovereignty of all states. I keep saying this, this is uh, wordings from the fourth paragraph of the preamble of UNCLOS and therefore it sanctifies what I just said about sovereignty and the accepted principle of international law that sovereignty over land is the basis for determining maritime rights is a ruling on the ICJ in support of this. And of course, maritime disputes would continue until the issue of sovereignty over land issues on islands is not settled. But this is one point. Another point is baselines, which I will discuss a little later and which Anirudh had mentioned. And then, of course, the complexity depends on the number of land masses involved or in, I will add now here the length of the coastline. And I will give you the two cases of Pakistan and India as a comparison when we come to it. Then, of course, is the impact of the rising sea level. What happens to baselines? Of course, there are articles that say that even if there is a change or if you interpret it that way under Article 7.2, but I'll come back to that a little later since I'll be covering it again. So then, nations always interpret national, uh, international law in accordance with the national interest. So there is always an interlock between national laws versus unclosed. And I will give you uh, an example of India's own two MZI Act 76 and 81 as examples of how we are aligned with unclosed, but yet there is a slight variation, which of course is in our own national interest. And all nations do the same. I will give you snippets of uh, what nations, how nations look at this aspect. National interests I've covered. When you look at baselines, now this is, uh, if you look at it, this is the first articles in UNCLOS that cover baseline. Therefore, these are the governing principles for maritime zones and everything therefore stems from baselines. Guidelines are given, you have UNCLOS articles 5, 7, 9, 10 and 47. Normal baselines are covered by Article 5, straight baselines are covered by Article 7. Now, of course, archipelagic baselines are Article 47, but we're not going to discuss that today. I had to look at it in August and I will just keep it out of the issue right now, but we can save it for question and answers later on. Then, of course, nations are free to use a combination. Now, the combination is only normal and straight baselines. And in that aspect, baselines are a source of tension. I've already mentioned this. And uh, what about sea level rise? Article 7, para 2 very clearly uh, states that in case of unstable coastlines, now, if you interpret unstable coastlines and say that sea level rise is causing the instability, I would say it is it is making the situation more complex. And one example we can always give is if uh, an island nation goes underwater or a lot of its landmass of islands goes underwater, what happens to baselines? What happens to EZ? Do the high seas get extended? So many questions. And if the baselines get eroded over a period of time, will nations be willing to redraw their baselines? pull them more inward so they are in conformity with the principles of uh, the articles of 5 to 7, 9 and 10 or would they keep them there thereby increasing the extent of internal waters and therefore the jurisdiction issue also comes in in this case. Give you this example, this is again from the United States Navy Judge Advocate General Branch and uh, this is Pakistan, straight base baseline. So if you follow the cursor, uh, Anirudh very clearly brought out that uh, you can't always have straight baselines because you see the way it is going. And as per the principles of Latin spirit of UNCLOS, it should have been somewhat running in line with the course. But you see the extent of internal waters that has been taken up out here. Now, this is based upon the coordinates that Pakistan had deposited with the United Nations Ocean Affairs Division. And therefore, this is a line which has been drawn. We have bring to your notice here, uh, the statement out here. I had mentioned it last time, but I had not shown it. So I thought I'll show it this time. Pakistan's straight, base, uh, straight baseline claim is not recognized by the United States. 
of course we have also put in an objection to this and uh, that is uh, deposited with the un uh, ocean affairs division that we do not agree with how pakistan has claimed the straight base ke, uh, baseline and therefore because we question the uh, base points far as india is concerned we again follow a straight baseline claim out here of course there are objections by various nations uh, this is the way it runs for us based upon our deposition of our baseline pakistan has objected to baseline the base points 1 2 3 1 2 3 are here the first three base points out here saying that it impinges on its uh, mm -hmm. sovereignty and uh, baseline and territorial sea we also have the same objection this close proximity here and here apart from the uh, line which i had shown you which encloses a lot of internal waters pakistan also objects to our base points 18 19 24 24 27 28 which are somewhere along this area south of mumbai and just north of goa I think that it is not in conformity with coastline of india because it is straight and it is not indented so this is the method in which nations uh, put their uh, objections i will also towards the end cover the objections indian myanmar have put in after bangladesh uh, deposited its new set of uh, base points or as it calls territorial sea base points or tsb in uh, as per their uh, as per their lexicon now that i will cover in my closing remarks out here so let's have a look on how does this impact freedom of navigation i said navigation and ocean governance issues so first of all Innocent Passage Unclosed Section 3 is very clear on what Innocent Passage is. I will not go through the definition. And of course, EZ and High Seas Unclosed Articles 55 to 59 cover EZ and 86 to 115 are covered by the High Seas. There is always that debate and the difference in opinion upon applicability of freedom of high seas within the EZ and particularly to uh, military activities. and therefore except for military activities the articles on ezr are quite clear regarding rights duties and responsibilities of nations and unclos article 58 talks about rights and duties of other states states shall have due regard i place that in red because the question is who is going to certain what is the due regard will a powerful nation adhere by this if it's compared to a, a, a coastal nation that is weaker than it there are many examples in history and there's enough uh, to go about by but i thought i'd place this on the plate the other issue is your innocent passage in, in the territorial seas and military activities are derived from the freedom of navigation the question here is that over a period of time the question of innocent passage freedom of navigation and safety has started being clubbing and with the quantum of uh, shipping that is going increasing day by day apart from this uh, covid period where uh, there may have been a reduction in shipping but we have seen a lot of ships continuously at sea and the crews are suffering because of that because they're unable to get off the ship due to the uh, national regulations in place of the ports they visit so there is a quantum of shipping that has increased and will continue to increase and therefore nations when they look at freedom of navigation to ensure safety of navigation they pose certain restrictions which of course is another argument uh, that we can debate later on and there is the extensive debates between global maritime powers and coastal states on the rights and freedom of the use of the seas consensus is on applicability of freedom of navigation especially innocent passage to merchant ships there are certain exemption exceptions that will come about in international laws including international applicable to armed conflicts at sea where uh, between two nations in conflict the merchant ship will also become a legal target and therefore may also be may have the seas closed to its navigation if it carries the flag of the belligerent nation <laughs> freedom of navigation is therefore interpreted differently in respect to warships military aircraft and auxiliaries and various nations have different uh, opinions about it so around 25 signatories of unclos have interpreted specific articles in accordance with the national interest i'll be covering that in some time they have placed conditions on the movement of warships and some of them made declarations on the ratification of unclos or in the national laws india has placed it in the 1976 mzi act it has deposited with the un affairs uh, ocean affairs division these conditions are reflected i so said this we will cover it in one as far as my readings go only china north and peru are, are known to have directly interfered with foreign military activities states uh, i have not come across any other examples and i'll be happy to know if there are any more than this as far as india is concerned <clears throat> our mzi act 1976 very clearly states foreign warships including submarines and other underwater vehicles may enter or pass through the territorial waters after giving 
prior notification. Now, there are two aspects to this, or three rather. One is innocent passage as is interpreted by nations that it is applicable to all. Therefore, you cannot stop the passage of a warship or a submarine through the territorial seas, as UNCLOS calls it. In our NZI Act, we call it territorial waters, an aspect that we may look at changing a little later on that issue out there. The second is, like India says, prior notification that you let us know that we are coming in. If you don't want you to come in, then they, it's very clear that we will let you know. And the other one is prior permission that you will enter only if we give you permission to enter, which means a nation whose uh, warship or submarine or underwater vehicle is required to pass through the territorial seas under innocent passage is to apply well in advance. And there are certain caveats nations are placed on that also. And of course, India understand the provisions do not authorize other states uh, military activities or maneuvers in the EZ. And this is a deposition uh, declaration we made when you when we ratified and cross. Malaysia is another example. Understand that provisions do not authorize other states to carry out military exercise or maneuver. Weapons are closed in the EZ without consent of the coastal state. Now, this gets, gets back to the point that Andero had mentioned that developing nations had a very strong say. So, you'll find that the examples which I'm giving are those developing nations who actually vociferously tried to push these issues through during, uh, during the debates and discussions when UNCLOS was being uh, drafted. But unfortunately, of course, that gray area still remains. Myanmar is interesting. It says foreign warships need to obtain permission prior transiting the territorial sea. This was in a 1977 law, which has been replaced by the Territorial Sea Zones Law of 2017. Now, when you look at Myanmar, uh, why does it want, why does it say uh, prior permission? Myanmar for a long time had closed its doors to the world and therefore uh, the issue of its own security and anything which it felt was a threat obviously ne necessitated uh, the leaders in the past that we come out with this sort of a uh, uh, ruling. For oh, South Captain Parma, if you can, if you can uh, limit your remarks into two minutes, next two minutes, please. Oh, wow. All right, I'll try, sir. Again, uh, time. All right. So, Republic of Korea has got the same pr three days prior notification, which is again a further restriction. Sri Lanka says again, you need uh, prior permission. Then, of course, when you look at Sri Lanka and it is sitting abreast all the uh, sea lines of communication that transit from the Malacca Straits on the other side, obviously there is a cause of concern. And especially since it has uh, was uh, in turmoil within itself and therefore it had to ensure its own security. Whether Sri Lanka decides to look at a change, only uh, the future will tell. Bangladesh has also got the same uh, issues out here. Vietnam restricts three warships at a time and again prior, prior permission. Again, Vietnam has a history in that area. When it comes about, when you look at uh, from 1954, when it uh, got independent or when it was reunified and the U.S. had to leave the problems with China, obviously this uh, pushes nation, this push Vietnam to maybe asking for prior permission. And China actually states of obtain advance approval or give prior notification to the coastal state. He said this is its understanding. Therefore, it does not very clearly say whether you need to take permission or notify. What about EZ enforcement measures? Uh, and clause 3 very clearly brought out by Anirudh was an extension of the coastal state jurisdiction, jurisdiction, specifically also to the EZ, which was sanctified to 200 nautical miles. And when the EZ coastal states have got certain sovereign rights, which are given here, which are in line with the UNCLOS, then, of course, uh, there are certain fundamental freedoms for other states, which other states need to recognize that the coastal state sovereign rights actually come first and theirs come second. But that's an interpretation that can be discussed. Therefore, there is a need to balance these conflicting interests. And this is where the divergences and convergences emerge from. Enforcement, uh, China has very, I just given an example in, uh, in accordance with provisions of one clause, shall enjoy sovereign rights restriction or easier of 200 nautical miles. Yet, in a Law promulgated in 92, it says reaffirms its sovereignty over all its archipelagos and islands listed in Article 2 of the law of the PRC as stated of 1992, which in, in a way is a divergence from the spirit and spirit of UNCLOS. One can interpret it that way. Insofar as India is concerned, MZ Act 1976, I just took out certain um, prominent parts of their thought merit attention out here. Sovereignty of India extends and extended to the territorial waters. I have marked it in red because 76 predates UNCLOS and therefore though MZI Act of 76 was aligned with UNCLOS, certain inherent differences. So one uh, amendment if we would like to undertake is change territorial waters to territorial seas. Not that it makes a, uh, much of a difference, but I think it looks a little nice to be better aligned. Of course, the limit of the territorial waters 12 nautical miles very clearly state, but it also says 
uh, wherever it considered necessary to alter by notification in the official there's the limit of the territorial waters you can't extend 12 so that means in a way that if we need to abide by international law then we may be willing to look at even a reduction in our territorial extension of our territorial seas if it comes to that but this is an issue that needs to be looked at when i look at the bangladesh case in my closing remarks and then of course this i've already mentioned and uh, prior notice is there to further on um we mentioned 200 nautical miles from the baseline of for the ez now if the coastal uh, continental shelf extension comes through and if there is a look at extending the ez then maybe if the whole unclos needs to be reviewed and if nations are pushing for an ez beyond 200 nautical miles due to the continental shelf uh, extension which is a debate separate debate which i am not personally in agreement with the ez should remain at 200 nautical miles this may be a figure that may require change then of course designated areas are there in the easel and continent so this is interesting and uh, the caveats are given in the mzi act 1976 but more importantly the act also caters for regulation of entry into and passage through these designated areas of foreign ships by establishment of fairway sea lanes if you remember i put a point in earlier that uh, nations reserve the right to do so if they feel that their security or their uh, it's not in their interest of uh, nations As far as the MZI Act of 98181 is concerned, regulation of fishing, all foreign vessels required to have get a license Captain or permit. Captain Parmar, can you fish. please? Yes, sir. You are you are please exceed. Yeah. All right. So I will just come to the end. But more importantly, the penalty for this in territorial waters is three years and 15 lakhs maximum. Is it at 10 lakhs? We may like to review this figure. Given that uh, in today's world, the amount would be much more. In my closing remarks. Uh, one issue is that if we are in acceptance while differing then we can do it on bilateral issues for example we have objected to the base points 2 to 5 of bangladesh's new base points which have been deposited and myanmar also objects to the base points specifically quoting 2 and 5 similarly although we may need to look at certain multilateral engagements to ensure acceptance even while differing in the best interest of regional global security therefore do we look at enforcement mechanisms or do we look at organizational pushes asean is one example where code of conduct has been languishing for some time but we can look at it under a certain organizational uh, already existing organization like say even iora or any other such or bimstech for that matter if it comes to uh, the bay of bengal issue and then of course we need to look at the sovereignty issues and i leave you with this map of bangladesh which is deposited by bangladesh and you follow the cursor 2 to 5 is somewhere here and myanmar's line is here So this is again something that although has been uh, decided by the arbitration uh, by arbitration there are still objections pending to it and with that i stop thank you uh thank you very much uh, captain parma uh we'll now move to dr pragya pande um and dr pande if you can uh, have your remarks within 15 to 17 minutes maximum thank you very much Thank you, thank you, Chair. And first of all, I'd like to say that it is my pleasure to be a part of this uh, distinguished panel on the with such experts on the topic. So, what I've tried to do do in my presentation basically is to focus on two major uh, questions. One is, uh, what 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 are the issues which kind of uh, uh, create uh, you know destabilizing tendencies in this legal framework which is set up by the UNCLOS? And the second is whether the cooperation and consultation mechanism can be a useful tool. in uh, in in you know in observance of the unclos 1982 so uh, uh, unclos 1982 as we as we know that it is uh, largely known as the constitution of the ocean it lays down a comprehensive regime of law and order in the world's ocean and seas establishing rules and governing all the uses of oceans and their resources it is uh, it is a culmination of sustained effort of the international community which began with the first unclos uh, with the first convention in 1958 and the second one followed uh, in the 1960 over the past uh, uh, four decades uh, majority of the united nations members have uh, uh, signed uh, the uh, unclos and at present uh, 167 uh, nations plus eu are party have submitted their ratification instrument to the uh, treaty to the uh, convention it was signed in a spirit of mutual understanding and cooperation certainly it is an instrument in promoting cooperation among the states as the preamble of the convention clearly mentions that convention desires a legal order which will facilitate international communication peaceful and equitable use of ocean resources and promote just international economic order taking into account interest and needs of entire human kind particularly the developing countries prior to the unclos the idea of freedom of seas the doctrine of freedom of seas kind of uh, governed the ocean ocean spaces 
which uh, continued to govern the ocean spaces by uh, roughly around the middle of the 20th century, when uh, this whole uh, uh, conflicting legal issues and uh, claims increased presence of maritime powers and over exploitation of ocean resources, and also claims over the offshore resources kind of begin to challenge the uh, existing regime of uh, uh, existing doctrine of freedom of sea, and uh, be, uh, and the oceans begin to uh, uh, you know look like another arena for conflict and instability. So this kind of situation necessitated a need for a universally applicable international uh, legal regime, which came in the form of UNCLOS 1982. And major significance of the UNCLOS 1982 basically lies in the demarcation of maritime zones, which have been already discussed in the previous two presentations. Uh, the territorial sea of 12 nautical miles from the baseline, contiguous zone of 24 nautical miles, and most, uh, most importantly, the EEZ, exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles. Uh, the, because the EEZ basically, uh, after the UNCLOS, puts 36% of the world's oceans by surface area are now encompassed in the exclusive economic zone. So, uh, uh, thereby, by addressing multiple questions of delimitation, settlement of disputes, marine scientific research, commercial and economic and technological activities in the ocean, the convention enables states to better utilize marine resources in a manner which is conducive to development and relatively free of conflict and safeguarding the rules of law in the ocean. India has actively uh, participated in the process of uh, uh, codification and development of the law of the sea. Uh, in, uh, India participated in both the, uh, both the uh, conferences of 1958 and 60, as well as in the 1980, uh, signed the uh, UNCLOS 1982 and ratified it in, uh, in 1995. Uh, the uh, Maritime Zones Act of India 1976, which precedes the UNCLOS 1982, incorporates all the, it, it's kind of a legal framework which specifies the nature, scope and extent of India's rights, jurisdictions and control of maritime zones and maritime boundaries. As a country, India has always uh, uh, been at the forefront of upholding the rules-based international order, and at various multilateral platforms, India has maintained that disputes are to be resolved through consultative mechanism rather than through unilateral or coercive actions. Now, coming to the uh, coming to the main uh, theme of my presentation, which is what are the kind of issues uh, or uh, kind of ambiguities which are uh, 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 presenting the challenge of destabilization of this legal regime. So despite the overarching legal architecture which is there, which is put up, put up by the UNCLOS 1982, there are still numerous unresolved disputes and challenges to the freedom of navigation by the state actors at times, as in the case of South China Sea. There is a strong connection between the law of the sea and the security at the national and the regional level. Because law of the sea on the one hand provides legal framework for national rights and obligation, it contributes to regional cooperation and dialogue for peaceful maritime regime. However, at times certain ambiguities in the law of the sea can be source of potential tension between the states. It is important to keep in mind that uh, although UNCLOS uh, agreement were put together after serious and prolonged deliberations on number of contentious issues, however, there are ambiguities and scope of interpretation is always wide, so as uh, it is difficult to get acceptance of all the member countries. Moreover, national security comes ahead of the international treaties. Also, the legal question goes hand in hand with the changing geopolitical equ equations, which play an important role in uh, determining the country's behavior towards the, uh, uh, to, towards the observance of the um, uh, treaties like the UNCLOS. Uh, there, are, there are problems at times when the domestic laws and the norms of the states are incompatible with the UNCLOS, which can lead to instability. And the assertion of maritime jurisdiction, reinterpretation of maritime zones based on such domestic norms can be source of destabilization. Uh, they, uh, besides, there's this whole uh, idea about inclusive versus exclusive, because there's this propensity among most of the coastal states uh, uh, wishing to extend that and tighten their jurisdiction over their maritime space and justifying it on the basis of uh, uh, their national security and protecting the sovereignty and sovereign rights in these waters. On the other hand, the maritime or the user state seeks to maintain maximum freedom of navigation, overflight, scientific research, and sees these restrictions as challenging their maritime, impacting their maritime uh, security negatively, particularly their naval mobility and their ability to take defensive operations. There is an inherent tension between certain navies structuring their forces for littoral operations and power projection capabilities, undertaking expeditionary operations in the littoral waters of other states, and on the other hand, those which are focusing on the sea denial capability, mainly supported by uh, applying restrictions on such, uh, such uses by the foreign uh, uh, navies. Uh, there are many examples of such conflict of interest which can, have been found, which can be found in the Asian waters. 
uh, from uh, 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 varying from the implementation of navigational regimes in case of uh, uh, innocent passage or straight transit passes, at the same time with the interpretation of rights and duties in the exclusive economic zones, not only military aspect of freedom of navigation, but also with regard to fisheries and other resources. With regard to the innocent passage, which is con contained in the conventions Article 17 and 18, the convention says that all the ships of ships of all the states, whether coastal or landlocked, enjoy the right to uh, right of innocent passage through the territorial seas, and this passage shall be continuous and expeditious. However, certain coastal states have put forward the uh, recommendation requirement for prior notification and authorization for such innocent passage of warships. Uh, U.S., which is has which has not yet ratified the UNCLOS, but rather uh, says that it observes UNCLOS as a customary international law insist on unconditional right of innocent passage through the territorial seas. On the other hand, China requires prior permission. U.S. has also challenged excessive maritime claims by uh, certain states, which require countries to seek prior consent for military exercises and maneuvers in their EEZs. U.S. maintains that uh, no prior permission is, need is needed for such military activities in the EEZs. Uh, U.S. has also objected to China for having uh, too many straight baselines, and uh, in December 2002, uh, China came up with uh, uh, China. China announced its uh, that it had enacted a new law which explicitly requires Chinese approval for all the surveys and mapping activities in China's EZs. And in 2006, again, it came another. Uh, it made another declaration which said that it would not accept any of the procedures of compulsory dispute settlement in relation to maritime boundaries and neighbors and those involving historic base and titles disputes covering military activities and certain kind of law enforcement activities. UNCLOS therefore uh, uh, leaves many of the questions open-ended, which are, which are open to interpretation in, a different, in different forms by the different countries. And what challenges the UNCLOS is the attitude of uh, uh, some of the countries of cherry-picking uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the clauses and the articles which they uh, find is useful and advantageous to them, and leave out those which are not. And also problematic is the behavioral aspect of uh, um, the uh, states which can challenge the legal regime, as has uh, happened in the context of international adjudication. Uh, if we compare, if you look at the India's and China's, uh, uh, you know, attitude towards the approaches toward the international adjudication, India has uh, grac graciously accepted the uh, the tribunal's award in in the case of Bay of Bengal boundary uh, arbitration case, as well as in the Enrique Lexi case. Whereas China's, uh, on the other hand, is the China's hostile attitude towards, uh, towards the permanent court of arbitration in the South China Sea dispute. And China's behavior during the, uh, in the process of arbitration shows disinterest in maintaining rules-based international legal order. So these kind of uh, uh, different interpretation and different uh, uh, you know, normative uh, and, and behavioral uh, pattern kind of challenges the UNCLOS uh, 1982 legal regime, and which will continue to be so in future. Uh, now coming to the second question, can uh, bilateral or multilateral consultations boost observance of uh, provisions of 1982 UNCLOS and contribute to the order of the sea? Uh, for sure, uh, the UNCLOS uh, contains some solid building blocks to contribute to a regime of maritime cooperation and ocean governance. Consultations are always uh, are, are useful as the whole idea of international legal system for oceans in the, of the world is based on the notion of consultation and cooperation among the parties. Therefore, it is desirable that parties may seek consultation on any dispute with regard to interpretation and application of provisions to arrive at a mutually satisfactory solution as soon as possible. And when such a consultation and solution is not possible, then follow the path of negotiation, inquiry, mediation, arbitration, and judicial settlement. Article uh, 169 of the Convention calls for consultation and cooperation with uh, other international and non-governmental organizations as well. Uh, one example of uh, 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 such uh, kind of consultative mechanism is the uh, the cooperative mechanism on safety and navigate safety of navigation and marine environment protection in Strait of Malacca and Singapore, which have been set up by the uh, uh, by by uh, by the cooperative efforts of Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, along with the uh, cooperation with international maritime organization and various uh, user states around the world under Article 43 of the uh, of the UNCLOS 1982. Cooperation uh, and consultation, therefore, is of particular value, particularly in the field of marine scientific research. Uh, the uh, cooperation between the states and with the competent international organizations in the marine scientific research is also encouraged by the UNCLOS. All the marine scientific research in the EEZs and on the continental shelf for peaceful purpose in order to increase scientific knowledge 
and marine uh, of the marine environment for the benefit of the larger international community is subject to the consent of the coastal state and convention imp imposes a duty on the coastal state uh, that the coastal state shall grant such consent in normal circumstances and not unreasonably delay it or deny it uh, and therefore both the researching state and the coastal state must harmonize their national legislation with the provisions of the convention and other relevant agreement and instrument to ensure that consistent application of uh, these provisions is possible uh, lastly, uh, the maritime governance and good order at sea are, uh, are kind of uh, issues which face such challenges not only from the actions of the state actors, but also from the non-state actors, which are multidimensional and, and can be multifaceted in nature. And they are uh, transnational in nature as they do not respect uh, national boundaries. Uh, the issues of uh, environmental pollution or, or, or piracy, these are uh, the issues which concern all the entire international, um, you know, the, the, it, it, it goes beyond the uh, national boundaries. And the uh, subject of, in, in such situation, the subject of uh, security is not a uh, state, rather the uh, human uh, community at large. So therefore, to deal with such ch challenges, it is very important that uh, the countries uh, should uh, try and, uh, you know, come over this strategy challenge of, uh, and work towards a paradigm shift from competitive to cooperative security so that the emerging threats like not tra transnational crimes and terrorism can be dealt with in a cooperative manner. To that end, an increased awareness and understanding of the interlinkages between global legal and policy frameworks and how they can support national and local frameworks is also very important. Effective cooperation and coordination as well as partnership across all the level and sectors will be critical in this regard, which can be facilitated and stimulated by uh, dialogues at the global level, international level, as well as experience sharing uh, in the, uh, in, by the countries and the region. So uh, with this, uh, I'll, I'll stop here and and over to the chair too. Uh, thank you, Pagya, for this paradigm shift from competition to conflict. I think we are looking for the solution and ideas for this competition to conflict regime. So with this, I would invite uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Sakuja, uh, for his presentation. Vijay, you have 15 minutes and then I'm pretty sure we would have a lot of questions because each of us have open quite a number of issues for the panelists as well as uh, participants. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Patel. I think we, I must uh, spare some time for the questions because that's more important than anything else. Most of us are conversant with the regimes, etc., etc. We try to share them as simply as possible for a larger audience to understand the complexity of the sea, because the regimes, etc. So I'll make my remarks essentially uh, very brief. Uh, I, I'm not going to sum up what each one of you said, but draw liberally from what has been said. Um, you know, when we set out to have the law of the sea, we thought we were bringing order at sea. I think we brought more disorder. We've had created more problems for us. We, we thought we'll have the nautical fence to tell us, okay, this is the limit that you go to. But that nautical fence, I guess, has been breached, breached and broken into. And we have huge number of issues which have really, I, I must say, it has spawned large legal discourse, academic discourse, policy discourse, foreign policy discourse, human discourse. I think you can bring the law of sea into any prism and start examining it and you find there are you know, answers to it, questions to it and some unanswered you know, issues also. Now, uh, the regime's interpretation practice. I think uh, what's happened is essentially uh, there is a certain body of law available to us. Again, the question comes is in terms of interpretation. How you interpret it? The very fact that at the fundamental level, the base point, the baseline, now that itself is going to be problematic for anybody. If we, if Pakistan has got certain say 20 base points, we will complain about two, and Pakistan does it in terms of India, seven, a dozen plus, etc. So this kind of attention will continue. I think we are adding more and more complexity. So, and in terms of our differences are much getting more pronounced in terms of the managing the regime, etc. So, uh, what do we do about it? I mean, at the heart of all this is there's the issue of sovereignty. I guess it's a question of national security. Where, where do you reconcile? That is where, when we talk of adjudication in terms of wrestling the matter, bilateral engagement or conciliation, that is where I guess there is a new domain which is opening up. Diplomacy has been always been paramount in such a managing such a 
think there's a new, new kind of a school we have to create where diplomacy comes in in a bigger way and try to resolve these issues. But then at the heart of it still lies, this is my territory, this is my so-called the line, which I am not willing to surrender. Now China has come up time and again during the discussion as uh, Anirudh also mentioned about, you know, uh, recalling uh, the China-Philippines uh, or Philippines-China uh, uh, case over the uh, South China Sea. As a matter of fact, I'm only tempted to recall it as a past, uh, I should say, a rich history as far as China is concerned. And this is an instance involving the Indian Navy and on the visit 1958, it was then. And this was before the war, of course, 1962, that one of our ships, Minus Mysore was on passage. That was also the time when the Jinmen crisis was at its peak. Ship was sailing as agreed at that point in time in terms of three nautical miles. Chinese had unilaterally announced a 12 nautical mile zone and had challenged the innocent passage that was being performed by Anas Mysore. The Chinese have had that kind of a history and again it's an opportunity. I think they've rather been demonized in those many terms. What's your, what is mine is mine, of course, and what's yours is also mine. To that extent, I think they have built up a certain kind of, let's say, a, a understanding of their own in terms of what legality is all about. They are still newcomers, if we must, if we look into the Chinese history of law of the sea, They're still newcomers, but they built it up very, very, in a, in a fast manner and built up their own body thought of rather interpretation. As a matter of fact, the moment South China Sea issue started brimming up and taking a position in the national team, they quickly set up a large number of institutions to study law of the sea. They sent out their scholars overseas to understand interpretation. This is the kind of investment Chinese did. And that's where I find that as Dr. Anirudh says, this is good, this subject is going to be in business for the next two decades. I think it's time we started investing in maritime law, under international law, commercial law, a variety of things. So it's again capacity building, not only we talk about capacity building of smaller states, I think we need to have a certain capacity building going on at There is a, a gene pool which is scattered. We have not been able to bring out, if I may suggest, a thing called as yellow pages of, of scholars, lawyers, practitioners or students for that matter who are studying this. I think that is where it has to be built up and I think these series of seminars in terms of the law of the sea I think are useful pointers towards that direction that we need to have not only external capacity but internal capacity at home. Now, Dr. Patel raised very, very interesting issues. While we talk about this is the body of law which has been with us for a while. It's been there with us, 1958, the 1982, I mean interpretation, counter-interpretation. I remember having a chat with uh, Ambassador Tommy Ko, uh, we were together in Singapore. And he said, when I told him, is it not time to have a look at, um, re-look at the whole, uh, you know, uh, law of the sea 1982. And he says, don't, a very, very sharp message, don't open this can of worms. Now, that is true. It is a can of worms. Every time you pull something out, everybody makes, any, any, any state makes a submission, CLCS or otherwise, right? Or there is a dispute. I think we, we come out with huge number of, uh, you know, issues from a bag which is full loaded, that full goodie bag of law, law goodie bag which we throw at each other. But then here again, I, I notice that there is an opportunity, conciliation is a very, very idea which should be pursued here. Uh, Dr. Patel also referred to in terms of ocean governance, very, very important. We've done a lot of now, let's say, promotion of the idea of blue economy. Blue economy is not in vacuum. Blue economy is going to be, is going to have, if I may use the, a very, very interesting terminology, law is going to be a monkey on the back of blue economy. Unless we understand the law, the maritime law, international law, law of the sea, blue economy I think will develop in vacuum. There are going to be interpretations. This is where we have to invest. There is a political, there is a political vision. There is a policy, Niti Ayo tells you we're going to build it up, but where is that body of law which is going to be looking at hundreds and thousands of facets of law, which will be very much connected with, with, with law. Finally, as I said, I'll be brief. I think there is another body of thought which we need to build up, 
you know, uh, in terms of as we go from automation to autonomous. We have fourth industrial revolution technologies hanging all around us. They're all using these devices. We use them as laptops, you know, palm tops and, uh, you know, our cell phones. Now, these are going to be now moving into, into the autonomous domain vessels, territorial waters, seabed, navies are going to use it. And then I see that this morning uh, in the US, they were now, they're going to have a 500 ship navy coming in the next 15, 20 years. And they're going to about 40% of these are going to be unmanned vessels. They're going to bring in new regime, new idea. There's going to be, then it will be a can of worms to talk. How do we go about looking at these very, very issues? Whether that unmanned vessel, or ve is it a platform, a vessel? How do we define it? What are the legal constraints with it? What baggage do they, legal baggage do they bring with it? I think what we've done today is, uh, I think we've brought these issues out. We've brought them into the, uh, onto the table, whether it is in terms of regime, you know, interpretations, uh, in, in terms of practice. But I think to put them, a lot of these things as regimes and practice and the law per se, into various domains and thematics, start looking at them carefully because each one is going to be a challenge for us. It is not just going to be knowing law of the sea. I think putting law of the sea 1982 into use into every thematic that is. There. I think I'll stop at that. Maybe we'll have more questions and answers. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Vijay, very much for uh, your remarks. An almost summary. So you did partly my job as well. So thank you very much. Uh, now I'm opening the question and answer. But before I invite more questions from, uh, uh, you know, Pragya has the lead. There are a few questions already addressed to us. I will put it before the panel to answer. The first question is, and maybe Anirudh can answer here. Unclose uses the word maximum 12 nautical mile which does not mean must for all nations to have territorial water of 12 nautical miles, which encourages disputes. What are the views of the panel? This is a one question from uh, um, from, from one of the participants. Uh, maybe the second question is more suitable to uh, Tarabjit. Uh, and the question is like this, general the goal Said treaties are like wines and roses. They last while they last. So how would you, uh, you know, give a political um, narrative uh, in terms of UNCLOS, uh, which has been posed to me? Uh, the third question is, amendment procedure to UNCLOS is deliberately left cumbersome and agreements and regional arrangements followed. So, of course, uh, the whole idea was um, not to allow as, as, um, uh, Anirudh also, sorry, uh, as, as, um, Vijay rightly said, if you do it, then we'll be opening the can of worms. So that is the reason why some of the procedures were deliberately kept, uh, unattended, particularly the amendment procedures. Because if you are going to talk amendment procedure, then we are going to open the entire, the tax itself. So with this particular remark on the last question, I would ask uh, if, if um, uh, Anirudh can please attempt the first and uh, Sarabjit can throw some light on the second question, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Patel. Uh, I would like to upgrade Ambassador Ko's comment of uh, saying that it would be like opening uh, a box of worms. I think it's a box of snakes and biting snakes. I doubt if anybody wants to open it. <laughs> So I don't know if it's an upgradation or a downgradation, but uh, we have to be very careful. And what is what I'm reminded of is was a very clear diktat in a, almost like a sense by Ambassador Martin Nye of Germany. And it's one of the most rule of the law here in the country. And Ambassador Nye said in uh, in Andamans, you may discuss whatever you want, but nobody is touching UNCLOS. Nobody is allowed to touch. It. Sorry for that bit of digression. Now, when UNCLOS says maximum, it means up to 12 nautical miles. Now, if a state doesn't have a territorial sea more than three, it just cannot claim anything more. So it's sort of logical. 
But it's quite possible that a states uh, also when you have two states that are adjacent to each other and the distance between their shores is six nautical miles. None of them can claim 12 nautical miles. They have to settle it through maritime delimitation, which might normally be three, three and three on both sides. So this uh, up to maximum, there's no conspiracy in it. And I think we have to be careful. You know, at times there's this tendency to read or invent conspiracies where there are none. So it's just a basic rule of very basic elementary logic. So we should not read too much into it. Thank you. I'll stop there. Yeah. Thanks, Anil. Uh, Paramjit, uh, Sarji, sorry, can you please? I, I get the call, right? I, I get that. It's one of my favorite uh, characters of history. And just going back to the issue of can of worms, I'm very fond of quoting Otto von Bismarck when uh, this and he alluded to the people who love the law sh and sausages should never ask how they are made. So we leave it at that, whether it is snakes or a can of worms. But uh, it is all legalese at the end of the day. Insofar as the uh, question is concerned, you know, when you look at history, how many nations have actually adhered to uh, conventions or international laws or even treaties for that matter? The moment uh, even before the ink has dried. On, on the document and I go back to what I keep on saying that nations will continuously interpret or look at international law and conventions, even bilateral, multilateral in through their lens of national interest. So conventions will suit a nation and they will follow it or they will hold or they'll stand up to it when their national interests are supported by it. Otherwise, they will not do it. And therefore, it is to be banded about as uh, a nation uh, feels like and therefore that's the way the world is. We live in a realist world and we have to accept that. Look at any NAT treaty for that example, even UNCLOS, UN Charter is under question. So we need to have a look at everything in total. The world has changed from 1945. Almost all conventions go back to the 1945 UN Charter. So if you have to look at them, are you going to look at the UN Charter? Of course, there is a different debate upon uh, the UN itself. But that's it. It's, that's the way nations will look at conventions and international laws and treaties. Okay. I'm, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to seek permission to step in onto this. You know, we tend to look at law, international law in binaries. One world is the utopian world of international lawyers where they say everything is law. The other world is of politicians where they say everything is politics. I must say neither extreme can be functional. States behave as per the law and states adhere to the law. And often there are occasions, for example, why hasn't Kulbushan Zadav been executed yet? You may may not like it. It's not no harm for a rogue state like Pakistan to simply execute him. But they're not doing it because there is the fear of the law. Yes, it's not as fearful as uh, as your domestic law of having capital. But law as a role, we as Indians need to realize the role that it can play the developed countries have very efficiently and effectively made use of it. And now we have to decide, are we still the third world who sits on the corner, throws stones on the law saying this is bad, this is colonial, or comes in the center, takes the law, holds the bull by the horn and bring it, bring it in our direction. And that's the point I think that Dr. Sakuja made quite well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anil, for this additional remark. There was one question which was put to this panelist, um, and the question is, was the decision of India not to put up a candidate for the Continental um, Commission, Limitation of Self Commission in 2017 justified, knowing pretty well that Indian representatives were held in high esteem ever since the commission came into being, and that the candidate would have been elected with a good majority as there would have been no prominent competitor from Asia. Moreover, it was known that Indian submission for extended continental self would come up for consideration in this term. India stood a big chance of becoming the chair of the commission as it was the term of a candidate from Asia for this position. So any, any remarks or any enlightenment on this uh, particular question from anyone who would like to answer? It's, it's somebody's laughing. Yeah, everybody is running away from it. Let me take a quick, quick uh, swipe at it. 
I was having a conversation with one of the sitting members of CLCS and he really regretted that there is no Indian member on CLCS anymore. And especially when, uh, when there are claims by India. And the reason why we participate in international courts and tribunals is, of course, it's a legal part. You know, it's, it's, called, it's called legal diplomacy. Knowing law and presenting diplomacy in legal forms is one of the integral parts of the process. And if you don't fall in the legal framework, then if there's no law, it's a different story, but you might be in breach of the law. So there are importance of these institutions, and I think that importance needs to be kept in mind. So I'm making some comment without making any comment. I'd just like to butt in a little bit here. If you look at it now, Singapore has been identified as a place where uh, you can have an arbitration tribunal sitting. So if the tilt is towards Singapore, why not India? And so even if we can't say field a candidate, at least we can provide the provision in the place for arbitration to take place in India. And with that, we may learn a lesson. And of course, the point that was brought out in the beginning that we need to have more and more experts. So is the shortage of experts the issue? Is the confidential level the issue? And therefore, we need to get emerged with it more. I mean, more than a candidate, we should, I think, pitch for uh, India to be a place where uh, we can provide an arbitration center. Uh, maybe just a, a brief comment, uh, Chair, uh, about maritime arbitration. I think um, that is one area probably where we are lacking. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm told uh, businesses dealing with matters, maritime or industry, etc., they all head to Kuala Lumpur. And they get a visa free access, etc., etc., et for the arbitration. Right. Similarly, people are going to Colombo. People prefer to go to Singapore. They do, I mean, still, they could still, choice is still London, but, or Hong Kong. But I think the neighborhood we are getting in. And if India can develop, I think we have several law, you know, every state has got a law universe. I think arbitration is a subject by itself. Maritime arbitration. I think we have an opportunity here where we can invest in uh, in terms of to begin with, I mean, to begin with, we take those baby steps. I think we should be able to attract and after all, we, our economy is going to get more and more maritime in those many terms, right, in terms of value and volume. I think it'll be a good idea where, you know, this whole idea of a maritime arbitration center coming up in India and uh, you know, helping our own industry. Uh, Pragya, how much time we have? We do have uh, roughly seven minutes, so we can take one or two questions from the chat box. Sure. So I have one question. Uh, China is becoming more assertive in the region, imposing its domestic law and challenging international rules and standards. Experts agree that China has used domestic law as a means to further entrench its maritime claims in the South China Sea. Question is how to counter China's strategies. So I think this question perhaps can be answered by either by Sarabjit or by Vijay. So I think both of you can chip in. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting one. I mean, I can't go. There is a Bombay Reef in South China Sea. I can't go from here and say Bombay Reef is my historical claim name given during the British hydrographers when the Indians were there, they were given. I think it's the community themselves, I mean, the claimants have to raise this very issue. And claimants to that extent are shying away. If you look at the case of the Philippines, I mean, they've got something, a, a, a cake in their hand. They don't want to eat it. I mean, they don't want to push it. Vietnam is shy. Indonesia doesn't want to push it hard. I think it's the claimants to that extent who drive it. And that is where I think also at the same time, I must say that, you know, the U.S. attempts to socialize China into a more moderate form of governance, you know, democracy and all that, that project has failed. And that is what they are, you know, they are confronted with. It'll, will it be worthwhile to socialize China into its national law or for that matter, you know, law of the sea? I think that's again a big question. But I guess, I think the, the, uh, the, the claimant states have the responsibility to push it. And I, and they have their own national interests. How far they want to push China? So there's going to be a, a kind of tension to to say, okay, now we bring China onto the table. Now start listening to us for the law of the sea. I think that's. I think what it's important that uh, a nation has to help itself first, and then only it can be uh, seek international support. You got to step away from this issue of say uh, claims and look at what is the uh, what is the pressure uh, point. It's economic leverage. 
The moment a nation disagrees with China, what does China do? It just presses the economic leverage button. If a nation can be told that, listen, we will give you the support insofar as economic leverage is concerned in, uh, against China, then perhaps that nation may like to take a more stronger stand against China in the, uh, in the South China Sea. And that would apply across the globe for any nation who behaves in that sort of an assertive fashion. There is one more, of course, there are more questions, but I think we'll entertain one more question. Uh, the question is, Enrica Lexi case brought out inconsistencies in the national and international maritime law. Does India's MZI act to proceed on clause 3? And why is it India not coming up with national maritime laws after 1982 so as to have more consistency between the two? Uh, Anirudh, would you like to throw some light? I know they are muted. I'm sorry. muted. Yes. Hello. Can I be heard now? Yes, Go ahead. Please. Yes. I'm a bit lost with the question because uh, may I request the chair to sort of rephrase for me if you don't. Sorry for that. No, no issue. Enrica Lexi case brought out inconsistencies in the national and international maritime law. Does India's MZI Act? to proceed on clause 3. Why is it India has not come up with national maritime law after 1982 yeah. so as to have more consistency between the national and international maritime law? Yeah, sorry, thanks. Uh, uh, all I meant was I was trying to find the essence of the question because it's for the members of the parliament to be asked why they are not amending it. I'm not sure if I can observe anything on their behalf and the, on behalf of the government of India. I but. I have to alert a certain tendencies and I have often noticed those tendencies. And uh, those tendencies tend to come from lack to appreciate the nuances of the regime of unclosed. And those tendencies are simply to put things into packages. They oh, Indian Act contrary to unclosed because it's national law, because it's old. Well, things don't just function like that. You know, one has to take a more nuanced approach. There might be areas of straight baselines which might encounter some problems, but that doesn't mean every baseline is going to have a problem. So, and and that's that's the thing about the law. And this issue often came up in inter, about interpretation, and and some perceive that interpretation is a problem. Well, interpretation is not a problem. Interpretation is an effort to narrow down the problem. Otherwise, we could have done whatever we felt like. But now we are in a zone where we can say these are the two or three options from which you can choose what to do. And that's where the broader question of international rule of law and that kind of things things comes. But I think I'll stop here. And if we have an opportunity of 30 seconds of closing remarks, I'll, I'll say something there. May I pitch in for a moment? Yeah, yes, Vijay and then Sarjit and I think we'll close because uh, yeah, what tempts us in terms of I think uh, I, there is uh, a lot of logic in what Anirudh says, but you know, we, we find in the neighborhood, say like Bangladesh, Myanmar, they were very quick after the arbitration, uh, for that matter, when we, they got the award, right? They were quickly working on their maritime zones act, 2017, 10 years later, or 15 years later, and that was the purpose. That is it time for us also to start looking at it? because now we we know there's a lot which is happening. Maybe MZI that we talk about, suppose in 2025 for that matter, right? We'll bring in lots of other issues into it. We will be ahead of the curve and also taking note of, after all these have certain shelf life, what Myanmar and Bangladesh have put out. I think that'll give us an opportunity. Or is it, it could be, to begin with, it could be an academic debate to be, is to start. I mean, there we start looking at what is the purpose? What are the new issues that have come up? And then probably let the parliament take a decision whether we need. I just have uh, two points to add here is that I think it's it's not correct to just uh, put dump and recall Lexi case on the MZI Act or national laws. There there are gray areas, yes, like we don't have an anti maritime piracy law to build till date. It's been on discussion since 2011. But it's incorrect to throw the whole uh, Enrica Lexi case. There are, there are huge errors committed on blunders by various. Uh, all around, in fact, whether it was national level, international level, and the way it was handled by various organizations. That Enrica Lexi case itself is a case in how 
to avoid compounding a very simple problem. Insofar as MZ Act, Act is concerned, when you look at it, the 1976 that it's, it's quite thorough when you look at it. It's fully aligned with UNCLOS. And then, of course, we have the right to put in a few caveats which impact our national security. If it does need refinement, then I, to my mind, it's minor refinement, some points which I brought out. And I think that's about all. And to tamper around with it too much may not be in, in our right interest. So I'll just stop here. So I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for their um, presentations as well as answering the questions. And um, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Raghavan for giving us an opportunity to, um, for the first time, I would say, to discuss a wide range of lobbyist issues and how it impacts upon the future interests of India vis-a-vis uh, -vis the UNCLOS. And I would, I'm sure uh, the ICWA will continue to host not only the law of the sea, but also the international maritime law uh, webinars as a subset subset of the overall strategy of uh, you know the foreign policy objectives of uh, of the country. So I thank you very much for everyone and uh, kudos to uh, our panelists for their time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for chairing this uh, webinar. As we come to the end of this very engaging webinar, it is uh, my pleasure to present a formal vote of thanks on behalf of the ICWA. I would like to thank uh, Director General ICWA, Dr. T.C. Raghun, for his constant support and guidance in organizing this webinar. I would like to express my gratitude to all the guest speakers for taking time out of their busy schedules and participating in this uh, uh, discussion. I thank uh, the DDG ICWA, Sri Soman Bakchi, and Joint Secretary, Ms. Nutan Kapoor Mahavar, for their continuous support. And I would like to thank Director Research, Dr. Nivedita Ray, and the entire research faculty, and the IT uh, and technical support of the uh, ICWA for the smooth running of the uh, program. Thank you all once again for joining. And we hope to see you uh, at the next webinar, which I is ICWA organized. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.